पॉजिटिविटी आने लगती है आई विल स्टार्ट विद द इवेंट नाउ यस विद योर परमिशन गुड मॉर्निंग वन एंड ऑल आई एम डॉक्टर प्रीति रावत ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बॉटनी देशबंधु कॉलेज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली extend a very warm welcome to all the respected faculty members research scholars and students from different colleges and universities who have joined us today for the second dr dk malik memorial alumni lecture the dr dk malik memorial alumni lecture series was initiated last year to commemorate the fond memories of dr malik an outstanding faculty of department of botany deshbandhu college whom we lost during the pandemic last year Dr Malik was a man of honesty and integrity and a teacher of our excellence as a mark of respect and love to Dr Malik and to pay homage to the divine soul we at department of botany deshbandhu college have organized the second lecture in this series today i would now request dr aparna notiyal teacher in charge department of botany to take the session forward over to you aparna ma'am a very good morning to all of you on behalf of Department of Botany, Desh Bandhu College. I, Aparna Nautial, welcome you all for today's memorial lecture in remembrance of our most beloved, humble, and uh, respectable colleague, late Dr. D. K. Malik Sir, who left us. untimely a year ago due to cruel pandemic and thus creating a huge void in our lives it is extremely uh, painful and hard to believe for all that he is physically no more for uh, uh, no more uh, no more with us and we are here today to pay our tribute on his first death anniversary for him i can say only one thing your life was a blessing you are memory a treasure you are loved beyond words and missed beyond measure धर्मेंद्र कुमार मलिक फॉन्डली कॉल्ड एज मलिक सर बाय मोस्ट ऑफ अस इन द कॉलेज वॉज अ लाइव एग्जाम्पल ऑफ द मोस्ट सिंसियर डेडिकेटेड पोलाइट एंड विजनरी टीचर इन ऑल टूगेदर विद टीचिंग एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ अबाउट नाइनटीन ईयर्स इन डेली यूनिवर्सिटी ही वॉज द मोस्ट फेवरेट एंड रिस्पेक्टेबल टीचर अमंग स्टूडेंट्स एज वेल एज हिस कलीग्स विद द डिवाइन एंड स्पायरिंग स्माइल ऑन हिस फेस मेनी ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स हुई अडोर्ड हिम एज they are role model a loving and caring guardian have now been placed in reputed position in different parts of the world as an academician and researcher he played a key role in growth and progress of the department and college by taking some key decisions his intelligence and scientific temperament with excellent writing skills made him a popular science blogger on twitter that gave him opportunity to get connected with few of the high profile scientists he was a prestigious plante fellow with good number of publications his unbearable tragic loss as a gentle kind helpful human being to his fellow colleagues a guiding motivating and inspiring teacher to his students and a caring loving and affectionate guardian to his family members would be irreparable all the time but his living memories and motivating words will stay forever with us throughout our lives on the remembrance of this great teacher and a wonderful human being we could not think any name other than dr eklavya chohan sir our most favorite former senior colleague who was very much closely att attached to malik sir and he was a guiding source to our dear malik sir during his journey in the college we are really thankful to you sir for accepting our invitation and to join with us today to make this event more memorable and close to the heart of dear malik sir i believe wherever our malik sir is now he must be connected to all of us to listen to you today i also express my gratitude and welcome our respected principal sir professor rajiv agarwal vice principal sir professor kamal kumar gupta iqac convener dr aditya sixena dbt coordinator dr indrakant singh and all other esteemed colleagues from our college as well as from other colleges and dear students who have joined with us to remember and pay a loving tribute to our dear dharmendra kumar malik sir with these words i thank you all from bottom of my heart to 
to join today in this remembrance. I would now hand over the session to you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, Parna ma'am. I would now request our respected Vice Principal, Sir, Professor Kamal Kumar Gupta to address the audience. Over to you, Sir. Uh, good morning. Am I audible? Yes, Sir. Yeah. Dvingat, Dvingat Atma Ko Shashat Pranam. I am the first respected, dear, lovable colleague, Dr. Dharmendra Malik Ki Atma Ko Shashat Pranam Karta Hoon Aur Unko जहां भी हो हमेशा सुख और शांति से रहें ये कामना करता हूं मैं बोटनी डिपार्टमेंट का बहुत एप्रिशिएट करता हूं कि उन्होंने इस महान आत्मा की स्मृति में ये लेक्चर सीरीज का अरेंजमेंट करा और इस सीरीज के अंदर ये सेकंड है पुण्य तिथि को याद करने का इससे अच्छा माध्यम इससे अच्छा ढंग नहीं हो सकता और इस सीरीज में इन्होंने एल्युमिनाई सीरीज टॉप को रखा है क्योंकि शिक्षक की सही पहचान स्टूडेंट ही करते हैं और इस तरह से शिक्षक स्टूडेंट्स की निगाह में अमर हो जाता है तो इस तरह है हम डॉक्टर धर्मेंद्र मलिक को अनंत काल तक याद कर सकते हैं तो बोटनी डिपार्टमेंट का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद इस प्रयास के लिए हम सभी को ज्ञात है कि डॉक्टर धर्मेंद्र मलिक पिछले वर्ष कोविड की सेकंड वेव में उनका देहांत हो गया था वो अभी हमारे साथ फिजिकली नहीं है लेकिन उनका दिखाया हुआ मार्ग सभी जूनियर कुलीग्स के लिए सभी सीनियर कुलीग्स के लिए एक आदर्श है और हम हमेशा उनके दिखाए रास्ते पे चलते रहेंगे डॉक्टर धर्मेंद्र मलिक एक बहुत ही मृदुभाषी सज्जन हमेशा मुस्कुराते हुए व्यक्ति थे वो एक आदर्श अध्यापक मित्र कुलीग और सबसे ज्यादा वो एक बहुत ही अच्छे इंसान थे वो एक रिसर्चर थे और हमेशा मेरी उनके साथ कई बार रिसर्च के बारे में बात वार्तालाप हुआ बहुत ही सिंपल चरित्र के थे इतने महान गुणों के बावजूद उन्होंने कभी इस चीज को दर्शाया नहीं तो इसके लिए उनको शत शत प्रणाम मैं अभी बात करता हूं आज के वक्ता डॉक्टर एकलव्य चौहान इनका तालुकात मेरे साथ तकरीबन 40 साल से भी पुराना है 42 साल पुराना जब मैं यहां पर आया तो उन्होंने मुझे पढ़ाया था और वो एक ऐसे थे कि जो अंदर बिल्कुल तुम्हारे मस्तिष्क तक तुम्हारे ब्रेन तक तुम्हारे हार्ट तक परकोलेट कर जाते हैं तो मुझे याद है उस दौरान हमारा ये बोटनी सब्सिडरी क्लास होता था और सब्सिडरी में स्टूडेंट्स ज्यादातर रेगुलर नहीं होते थे क्योंकि इसके कोई मार्क्स काउंट नहीं होते थे बस पास करना होता था बट मुझे याद है आई नेवर मिस्ड अ सिंगल क्लास ऑफ डॉक्टर एकलव्य चौहान ही वॉज सच अ फाइन टीचर ही वॉज सच अ नॉलेजेबल पर्सन ही वॉज सच अ वंडरफुल ओरेटर सो ऑल माई प्रेज एंड अप्रिसिएशन और मैं हमेशा अगर मैं आज किसी काबिल हूं मेरी जर्नी स्टूडेंट से वाइस प्रिंसिपल तक रही है तो मैं इसका काफी श्रेय डॉक्टर एकलव्य चौहान को देता हूँ डॉक्टर एकलव्य चौहान का मेरे साथ स्पेशली बहुत ही तरीके से इनके साथ इंटरेक्शन हुआ है एज अ टीचर फिर एज अ कलीग भी रहे और एक और इंटरेस्टिंग बात है डॉक्टर एकलव्य चौहान के साथ मैं शेयर करता हूं मैं और डॉक्टर एकलव्य चौहान देशबंधु कॉलेज के स्टूडेंट भी हैं तो हम यहाँ सहपाठी भी रहे हैं टीचर टोट भी रहे हैं और फिर कुलीग भी रहे हैं सो दैट इज the things i share with dr eklav chauhan but yes there is no match as far as teacher is concerned like uh, i i can say that there would be very very few teachers of his metal who are there then uh, i i welcome you professor dr eklav chauhan for this uh, series of lecture 
on behalf of me and also on behalf of Deshbandhu College. I welcome Dr. Indrakant, DBT Star College coordinator, who is always an inspiring for our young colleagues and also the senior colleague, as far as research is concerned. He's always a motivating force and always come with many ideas to promote research among the students and also the teacher. I welcome Dr. Aditya Saxena, IQSC coordinator, who always work constantly for in various parameters of Deshbandhu College. Welcome. I, I welcome Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, our principal, always supporting, encouraging, versatile, dynamic person for Deshbandhu College and have a vision for the overall development and growth of Deshbandhu College. I welcome all the participants, faculty members from Deshbandhu College and other colleges, students, and all the participants. Welcome you all for this memorable talk. This is memorable because of two reasons. One is because in the memory of Dr. Dharmendra Malik, and also the talk is delivered by one of the most distinguished speaker, Dr. Eklave Chauhan. The, the talk, if I just uh, looking, I, even I may be learning a couple of things, cellular respiration revisited. They're certainly going to be very, very fascinating and interesting. But here, if I just ask the audience, one of the very, very first aspect which define, which distinguish living and non-living, what is a very fact by which life actually exists is the energy. And it has been explained at various level. It may be divine energy, it may be soul, it may be ruhu, it may be anything. So this energy is the basic difference in the life and known life. If we see the physical rule of life, physical rule, the life defy the basic physical ru rules in terms of entropy change and also the enthalpy change. So delta G, in the physical world, the delta G has a different meaning and in the life, the delta G has a different meaning. And what defy this basic principle of energy? So to sustain life, to, to remain life, we need constant energy. We, if we are not getting energy, we are not able to get the energy. This means that's the end of the life. So constant supply of energy is required. And from where we get this energy? Again, the main aspect is the respiration. You can say digestion, circulation, and all these things, but all of these worked in integrated manner. But whatever the food we get, food may be varied, but the basic process to get energy for life is the respiration. Let it be bacteria. It is, it is, a, it is a, like what, what, what I say, uh, a, a universal process, right? From bacteria to the human being, the most complex. So energy is required through the respiration. So I, I, I know that this talk is going to be very, very fascinating because the cell respiration is redefined. And if uh, the keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Eklav Vechohan, so I think I shall not discuss uh, that this wise on my part, not to speak much more. And we are all eagerly waiting for Dr. Eklav Vechohan to hear. So thank you. And uh, I, I will certainly, I'm, I'm eagerly waiting to give the platform to Eklav Vechohan. So over to you, Preeti. Thank you. And we can invite Dr. Klavach on. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind and wise words. Thanks once again for addressing the audience. I would now request Dr. Madhurani to introduce the distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Klavach Chauhan. Over to you, Dr. Madhur. Thank you, Dr. Piti. मेरा जो आज का टास्क है ऐसा लग रहा है जैसे मुझे सूरज को दिया दिखाना है हालांकि चौहान सर को किसी इंट्रोडक्शन की जरूरत तो नहीं है लेकिन मेरा ऑनर है और मुझे ये मौका मिला है तो मैं कुछ लाइनों से शुरू करूंगी सबसे पहले तो नमस्ते टू द गैदरिंग सैडली मिस्ड अलोंग लाइफ्स वे क्वाइटली रिमेंबर्ड एवरी डे नो लॉन्गर इन आर लाइफ टू शेयर बट इन आर हार्ट यू आर ऑलवेज देयर मालिक सर सम ट्रूथ आर very hard to accept in life. Your departure is one of those hard truths. 
So today we are gathered here to celebrate eternal memories of Dr. Dharmendra Kumar Malik sir, and it is my honor to introduce our invited speaker for today's occasion. He is a proud alumnus of this college as a student, as well as former associate professor of Department of Botany for over four decades. Our respected Dr. Eklavi Chauhan sir, we find solace as Chauhan sir has joined us for the remembrance of Malik sir. Dr. Chauhan graduated in 1972 from Deshbandhu College and completed his MSc in Botany from Department of Botany, University of Delhi in 1975. He received his PhD degree from Department of Botany, University of Delhi in 1981. Dr. Chauhan joined Deshbandhu College again as lecturer in 1977 and completed an extensive journey in 2017 when he retired as associate professor from the department. During his glorious 42 years in this college, Dr. Chauhan held various management positions including teacher in charge convener for sports committee library committee garden committee bursar and members of many more committees dr chauhan has been awarded fellowship under german academic exchange service during 1984 to 1985 and again in 1991 he worked at the ulm university in germany during this tenure he was awarded young scientist fellowship by dst government of india to work on ultra structural studies of bryophytes during 1986 to 1987 he was also awarded commonwealth academic staff fellowship by the commonwealth scholarship commission of the united kingdom during 1989 to 1990 he worked at department of biology at the university of southampton during this period dr chauhan's publications include 26 research papers in international and national journals 10 papers in international and national conference proceedings and more than 150 popular science articles in the newspapers like the hindustan times junior statesman and papers of the language press in the capacity of science correspondent sir has edited and translated several books he has been editor in chief of environment and wildlife and one earth dr chauhan has presented many papers in international and national conferences he has delivered a number of invited talks presently dr chauhan is working as senior consultant at school of sciences ignu sir has contributed over 8 video lectures in swam prabha dth channel and over 56 video lectures under consortium for educational commission by ugc mhrd government of india he has also developed e content for the national mission on education through information and communication technology at university of delhi and also for cec educet by ugc dr chauhan has not ceased to be an inspiring teacher and igniting educator even in his second inning after retirement in fact i would say he is exploring new horizons to accomplish his passion for teaching with more vigor now sir you are like a never exhausting torch of knowledge inspiring us more and more every day all our students as well as faculty participants are eagerly waiting for your talk today on the topic cellular respiration revisited we all welcome you sir i humbly request all the participants who wish to say their feelings for malik sir to post their names in the chat box after the talk we will pay our tributes to malik sir i also request the participants to post their queries regarding today's lecture in the chat box all the questions will be taken up after the talk during question answer session i would now request and invite dr iklavi chauhan sir to deliver his talk over to you sir okay i'm making you co-host sir am i audible okay. yes sir okay so i uh, i should thank once again <laughs> thank you very much and i am i am really humbled by the kind words uh, by dr madhu and uh, professor kamal gupta to professor kamal gupta i am particularly thankful because he has uh, knitted a very good introduction to my talk today uh, on respiration 
and uh, it, it is my humble duty to uh, to be here uh, in memory of my one of my favorite colleagues uh, dr malik uh, such a humble person so much has been said about him uh, i only uh, was reminded of a very famous buddhist saying a monk was asked how would you stand taller he said by bowing down so so was the character of uh, dr malik being so much accomplished educationally he was still a very very humble person i have never seen him in bad temper i have never seen uh, lines on his forehead even though he must have been tense sometimes a perfect character so uh, it is in fitness of things that we uh, share our thoughts regarding the uh, departed soul and and i'm sure his uh, his uh, wishes and his stay in the department uh, would would linger as long as our department stays to my uh, colleagues dr parna notial i am particularly thankful for organizing such a uh, such a nice uh, gathering and and a get together i would only summarize uh, the morning session uh, till now in three words and that is it is uh, <coughs> yesterday once more okay so let me just uh, begin by uh, a confession my uh, interaction with the, the audience today is by no means a textbook discussion uh, it is just cellular uh, respiration revisited which means uh, some of the key concepts that i feel the students ought to know and they know it less so why not put them across and for particularly for the young teachers also because uh, i always uh, used to tell my uh, younger colleagues that it is very easy to complicate but it's very difficult to simplify so let us uh, follow that particular dictum and try to simplify things but in the process uh, many of the things get lost so uh, let, let us see how do we uh, how do we proceed with the our cellular respiration i i uh, begin uh, the whole idea by um, just displaying uh, just give me a minute i may not be very savvy with the whole idea how do we do that no by text time how do we share the screen now mm. no screen. sir if the ppt is opened already oh uh, yes so you can choose that share in share there is a option for window just a sec just a sec okay i i put it back here the screen na huh? is that the one uh we are not able to see it sir uh, now okay. it's visible the screen is showing screen is showing but okay, your entire then... desktop is visible yes sir okay so that means the the ppt should also be there it's visible sir so visible is that the one yes sir yes sir okay so uh, the idea is that i begin with uh, with the good old days a photograph of all my esteemed colleagues uh, along with the late dr malik i think dr shantanu was not there he had gone for for his flight course and uh, uh, these are very very fond memories that i have of the department with dr malik particularly uh you you can see the tree ferns in the background we had 
a visit to uh, Gangtok and Sikkim and uh, Shantanu and myself. And we, we, we really had a lot of botanical discussions over the whole idea. And uh, these memories would always remain fresh and live in my heart. Uh, beginning with the whole idea of uh, cellular respiration uh, revisited. What we have to think now is that uh, as the professor Kamal Gupta very rightly introduced, that respiration would be in terms of energy, the delta G, the free energy, and it would be a characteristic, a prime characteristic, which would distinguish a living from the non-living. Fine. But then how do we define respiration? In spite of uh, teaching for so many years, if someone was to ask me define respiration, I would just pause and think, is just one parameter enough to, to uh, define respiration? If I'm running fast, and I'm uh, now having uh, a little uh, fatter belly, uh, I would say that I'm burning my calories. Do you think that respiration is combustion? So that means one has to be very clear. When we are talking about cellular respiration, what are the various aspects uh, of, of this particular biochemical process? In other words, can we really compare cellular respiration to burning of wood? Well, it will be quite likely uh, they, they are comparable as far as the thermodynamics is concerned. But then the calorific value also may be the same, but then they are not the same because cellular respiration is going to be an intracellular process. It is going to be an exergonic process. It is going to be an exothermic process. And temperature will not be allowed to change. In other words, we don't have to talk about uh, the, the temperature changes because living systems are nothing but isothermal chemical engines. So in other words, whether it is a metabolic oxidation of glucose or you take a, a bomb calorimeter as we the, the uh, experiments we perform in ecology, you, you uh, burn glucose or you burn wood, they will all have the same equation, which is the classical equation. But then here, the delta G is uh, minus 2870 kilojoules per mole. We will shortly talk about this uh, delta G business and how is it related to 686 kilocalories. We will have to change our mindset regarding some of the figures subsequently. If we look at a complete oxidation, the classical uh, equation that we have been studying and teaching for, for such a long time, we say that uh, six molecules of uh, oxygen are taken in uh, during the time of biological oxidation and uh, six molecules of water are produced. Now, this is not a true biological representation. It is actually an empirical equation we would see things are a little different. The reaction is exothermic, all right, and exergonic, we are going to talk about it. But then actually what happens is that we have not shown how does this oxygen actually react? Does it react directly with sugars? No, it is actually a terminal acceptor of electrons and protons at the end, fag end of the electron transport chain and then it forms water. And this entire reaction is according to a descending redox potential. So therefore, we would have a better expression of uh, aerobic respiration by saying that six molecules of oxygen are there, but then 12 molecules of water are actually produced. So six are the reactants and 12 are produced. So we have just uh, for, for the sake of brevity, we have just uh, oversimplified the equation here. A student should always remember the conversion and the right connotation. That is, uh, one kilocalorie is equal to 4.184 kilojoules. So if now, with this little background, we talk about the 
uh, oxidation of glucose and now we try to accurately represent a coupled reaction because in nature we have coupled reactions that is the reactions which are producing uh, energy they are generating energy and the reactions which are consuming energy so we find that uh, the coenzyme 1 10 molecules of nad are formed the two molecules of fad are formed and in the whole process as i said in the previous slide 12 molecules of water are there so the net reaction would be of uh, the oversimplified equation it doesn't tell us much again let us review this whole idea in the form of free energy as uh, professor gupta said in his introduction the idea is that uh, free energy reactions exergonic will have a negative delta g and the free energy requiring reactions will be having a positive delta g so we can make a representation in terms of one mole of glucose during respiration is coupled to phosphorylation of 32 moles of adp resulting in the generation of 32 atp so that means we know that these particular reactions are additive i will stop here because many of uh, the uh, viewers would be thinking from where did this 32 come from because we have been throughout teaching 36 38 atp molecules but you know our our these figures they change depending upon the the uh, uh, sophistication in techniques of analysis on x-ray crystallography on on other modern techniques so this is 32 figure uh, let me uh, confess and uh, and tell you uh, to some uh, two very old stories which uh, suddenly came to my mind Actually, uh, like all students, I, I should not say like all students, like all average students, when I was a student, I was also allergic to knowledge. In the sense, whatever was given in the textbook, I used to follow it. And if my teacher used to tell me uh, something different, I would have said, oh, no, no, there, there's something different and so on. Let me give you two examples. And I don't know, maybe we were studying at a time when, when the new discoveries were made. One fine morning, uh, my esteemed teacher, uh, Mrs. Bajaj, she, who was teaching us genetics said, uh, do you know uh, RNA also gives rise to DNA? Now, that was the time of the discovery of feminism. It was uh, 71, 72. We didn't know that. So, uh, as the young mind goes, I thought maybe she uh, had a bad night and fight at home with her husband and uh, she's talking all ulta. But, but then uh, it was true. We, we had little faith in our teachers, you know. Uh, the very next morning, uh, Dr. Verma, my, uh, my mentor and idol, from whom I have learned plant physiology, uh, said, oh, do you know, some plants, the uh, stomachs close during daytime and uh, open during night. Now, this was the year 72 when we were studying physiology and uh, CAM cycle had been discovered. So I only thought, oh, no, no, uh, maybe he had a, a little more last night. He must have gone to a party and he he's talking all ulta. No, it's not like that. So uh, please do not have a similar reaction uh, for me when I say it is 32. We would like to justify this, right? So we, we are now away from 36 and 38 and we have reached uh, 32. So just, just remember that. So uh, again, to come back to track, Kipps free energy change for glucose is minus 2900 kilojoules to a mole, which means how do we reach at uh, the, this particular point? That is, it has been calculated that it is a spontaneous reaction. It is an exergonic reaction. And uh, we know that each ATP formation would require 50 kilojoules. So if we take in the equation of 32 ATP formation, we would be requiring 1600 uh, kilojoules. So the sum total would be that we still have uh, a surplus of 1300 kilojoules uh, of glucose. So in other words, this is a very, very uh, good aspect to say that the stoichiometry of 32 ATP with a net 
delta g change of minus 13 is 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 immense driving force for the process of uh, respiration what exactly is stoichiometry because we always use the term the stoichiometry of a particular reaction it is in fact the relationship between reactants and products in a reaction it will actually represent the quantitative relation between the number of moles and therefore the mass of the various products so this is how we we can understand a particular chemical reaction coming to the delta g business that is gibbs free energy we will talk in terms of thermodynamic potential this is what we use to calculate the maximum reversible work or useful work which can be performed by a thermodynamic system at a constant temperature and pressure mind you i said in the beginning the cellular respiration the living organisms are isothermal chemical engines if i say i am burning calories it doesn't mean that i have an internal combustion engine in my stomach right i am burning calories but then it is in a different manner it is in the form of a chemical uh, transformation although heat may be produced and heat is produced because no machine can be 100% efficient so that means this concept of uh, uh, free energy was given by joseph willard gibbs in 1873 and uh, uh, as uh, dr gupta talked about the equation that is the delta g is equal to delta h minus t delta s we are talking in terms of the gibbs free energy change the uh, enthalpy change of uh, of delta h and of course the change in entropy when we are talking about the delta s and as i said before the equivalent of uh, a 14 or uh, 4.18 kilojoules to to a calorie so that means this is how we had reached the equation which i showed to you the first of uh, the uh, respiratory process you will be surprised to know that uh, when you are resting you are actually turning over 65 kilograms of atp every 24 hours which is almost equivalent to body weight i think my weight is now more than that right okay so that means this immense amount of turnover of it just to summarize therefore because uh, a, a child always uh, uh, forgets you know we have to uh, always uh, put it in his mind when is the delta g negative whether it is thermodynamically a feasible reaction or not so that means if the delta g is negative then it is uh, free energy is actually available to the work and this is what we uh, talk in terms of a reaction being thermodynamically favorable however the reverse process will not be favorable right and if you have an equilibrium then of course the delta g would be zero and if it is positive then it is an unfavorable reaction how to how to make it a favorable one you have to spend extra amount of energy another very simple question which a student should know is about the structure of atp because uh, we only simply say AD, uh, atp gives rise to atp plus pi uh, without uh, going into the details of the stoichiometry actually the atp molecule is adenosine uh, and of course you have a ribose sugar and the three bonds the presence of ribose immediately gives us an idea that this compound is related related to rna it is a ribo nucleotide what else do you require for a nucleotide a nitrogenous base a sugar and a phosphate it has three instead of one and then the bonds are are uh, named as the alpha beta and the gamma and the gamma being the terminal bond and it is the most favorable to break once so that means the bond with the outermost phosphate group would be prone to hydrolysis and uh, this would uh, this particular bond uh, the gamma bond would have uh, a potential of 7.3 kilocalories which is equivalent to 30.5 uh, kilojoules uh, most of my uh, interaction with you today is based on calculations because how do we how do we calculate the whole idea of efficiency in respiration so this was the first bond the second bond is uh, 7.74 and the alpha bond is uh, is a normal covalent bond which is 3.29 uh, kilocalories now 
how efficient is the process of uh, respiration we have just mentioned uh, without justifying that a maximum of 32 molecules of atp are generated now one atp would store 7.3 kilocalories so we would have 233.6 kilocalories uh, to be stored but in the equation we showed 686 so that means the efficiency of anaerobic respiration is approximately 34% in all of the older books if you were to take now 36 here or 38 here obviously the percentage of efficiency will will uh, vary but then uh, this is the, the the modern concept of uh, of the respiratory process and only 34% now a student would immediately ask what happened to nature why couldn't it be 75% so the logic here is that when this delta g and the energy stoichiometry evolved in nature it took a balance because some amount of heat is also generated and you have to follow the basic idea that if there is efficiency will be so high one of the aspects one of the ingredients could become limiting and if it would become limiting then it would not be very very healthy from the evolutionary point of view because then it would not be able to compete with the other metabolic processes or the other biochemical processes this is what the evolutionary biologists have to say but then coming to the basic statistics what would happen to the uh, 66% of energy which is lost we know that no machine ideal machine is 100% but no biological machine would be 100% so this amount of energy would be dissipated out uh, in the form of heat right so it's a step wise transfer if we were to compare this with anaerobic respiration anaerobic respiration would have an efficiency which is very poor because uh, only 2 atp are uh, the, the net gain of uh, anaerobic respiration is only 2 so it will come out to be 2.12 so the story is a comparison between 34 and 2.12 so it's approximately 17 times more so the overall equation if we think in terms of even the quantitative relationships we find that incomplete oxidation that means uh, anaerobic respiration would yield only 280 right uh, a child would ask why why did you not divide it by 56 because 56 was the one which is released but the total potential is 686 so we will always divide it by 686 and not by 56 this is a very common question which is asked in the class so it is 32 versus uh, versus 280 uh i have always had a problem in explaining to students uh, what are facultative anaerobes and what are facultative aerobes because uh, it was very difficult to make them understand ki jo likha hua hai wo nahi hai aur jo hai wo likha hua nahi hai in other words the facultative anaerobe is basically aerobic but it has the faculty to act as an anaerobe so facultative anaerobes are basically aerobic and they can switch over to fermentation and anaerobic respiration in the absence of oxygen take the example of yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae for example now it's very happy in uh, in aerobic conditions because uh, it has mitochondria and if you uh, put it to ferment something it will uh, switch over and it would now uh bring about the process of fermentation it would not die so it is uh, it has uh, an advantage in evolution to to uh, to have a a by mode of uh, of respiration so same we have with e coli salmonella and uh, staphylococcus uh, the spelling are word here okay listeria and yersinia pestis on the other hand the there are uh, uh, there, there's no point talking about the obligate ones because obligates they cannot uh, live uh, without a particular uh, oxygen or without us facultative aerobes are the ones which are essentially anaerobic but they would not require oxygen normally but if oxygen is made available to them then they can survive in aerobic atmosphere now how would they do that because oxygen tends to be toxic for such species 
so they should have certain enzymes which are the scavengers for free radicals so they have essentially a superoxide dismutase and the catalase enzymes which will scavenge these free radicals that is the superoxide radicals and the hydroxyl radicals they could also be called as uh, aero tolerant uh, anaerobes and uh, some books also call them as micro aerophiles although there is a minor difference uh, a very uh, illuminating example is of uh, heliobacter pylori you know the one which causes uh, peptic ulcers another aspect which we uh, talk from the exam point of view is the rq why i chose this uh, to spend some time because uh, the value uh, open uh, happens to be exactly opposite to what we study in photosynthesis so rq is the volume of co2 evolved by o2 consumed right so co2 by o2 whereas in photosynthesis we talk about the photosynthetic quotient which is o2 by by co2 and here is a, a, a little account of what are the various situations how rich a compound is in oxygen in relation to carbon we have different ratios so always uh, we we think of uh, such numericals and such short questions right so carbohydrate since we find that c6 is equal to uh, o6 and the amount of oxygen which is required uh, uh, yields an equal number of carbons so that means it is one unity fats are poor in oxygen and uh, so are the oils and proteins and therefore their rq is less although fats have a higher calorific value because of the presence of more bonds so they are bond energy so it doesn't matter it's not a prerequisite that a uh, that a compound which gives more energy would have a higher rq on the other hand i would make it a point to explain to you uh, what would happen in case of cam plants see the cation succulents they will show a cam cycle during night that means during night these stomats would open and uh, uh, the process would occur in such a way that four molecules of carbon dioxide are are not given out but they are generated now this particular co2 is immediately taken up by uh, the pep carboxylase and you will have now the the formation of malex and so that means it is not released outside and therefore you would find that ultimately the rq would give rise to the, the this equation will give rise to malic acid and uh, therefore there is no release of carbon dioxide at all we are not bothered about what is happening inside we are only measuring the the amount of oxygen taken in and the amount of carbon dioxide given out so that means in this case the rq will be equal to zero but then what happens during daytime during daytime the malic acid because the stomats are closed and now the organic acids would now deacidify that is the malic acid would deacidify and since organic acid is slightly richer in oxygen it would require less of uh, oxygen from outside and the rq then becomes greater than 1 so one should remember that rq of cam plants at night is zero but it is greater than 1 during day time in case of anaerobic respiration uh, it is infinite because there is no question of oxygen here so that means the value now becomes incalculable here is a set of questions which we have asked ourselves the germinating ways grains all of them have uh, have sugars carbohydrates as their reserve food material so they are equal to 1 germinating groundnut mustard and castor seeds they are they they have a reserve food material of oil they have to be converted into into sugars and this is called as the mobilization of uh, metabolites before uh, uh, seedling could come so that means essentially it is the respiration of of uh, compounds which have a rq less than 1 but then maturing cereals maturing cereals means uh, it is from sugar to sugar so it is again one dark grown plants we know that plants which are grown in dark may not have much of sugars and they are not showing what is called as floating respiration they are showing protoplasmic respiration because they may even be starved so in that case the rq has to be less than 1 because then the reserve food material would not be sugars sugars are already consumed so they would be less than 1 and maturing mustard and castor seeds that means here now the sugar has to be 
converted into uh, into oils so sugar is comparatively oxygen rich and fats are comparatively oxygen poor so when a rich becomes poor where is the surplus going to go so that means now the rq would be greater than 1 so these are some of the jugglerys a very interesting aspect is that many of the microbes they can also use hydrocarbons as their energy source and uh, these are called as the humbugs can you imagine they even survive in jet fuel and even in diesel and they can break it down you know it's a very very important aspect because these days uh, one is uh, uh, talking about bioremediation and they can be used as very very effective biosurfactants for solubilizing the contaminants in giant oil spills it's very expensive to have a oil spill now because oil prices are very high bio remediation through removal of uh, environmentally hazardous hydrocarbons is a very important aspect because uh, we can now genetically engineer these microbes to have a particular type of a respiratory process at the end of this part 1 let us just uh, have a very quick uh, google map if we can say of the process of respiration which means that is the, the the sugar has to be broken down glucose i don't know why we always start with glucose i will just come to that because in plants we do not start with glucose so it's again a mindset we 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 got to alter and uh, then we have the glycolysis process and uh, we have the production of nad and atp we will just see the net gain is 2 atp and finally if oxygen is present the uh, pyruvate which is a three carbon compound would enter the mitochondria for uh, oxidative decarboxylation production of acetyl coa and krebs cycle we we, we would have uh, the uh, alternative cycle which is called as the pentose phosphate pathway if uh, nadh is there in maturing tissue and in certain bacteria we have what is called as the entener daudorov cycle which is another uh, alternative pathway let us uh, look at some aspects of uh, glycolysis or the emp pathway or the emden meyerhof and parnas pathway uh, we all know that this particular pathway has has two phases and uh, 10 steps and uh, first is the is the phase which is uh, you have to uh, give some energy which is the starting phase and then you have the pay off phase and uh, if we look at it a little more closely we would find that uh, what i want to uh, here uh, demonstrate to you here is that we have to be very careful we remember uh, emp pathway all right but we should be extra careful in putting the arrows because they are of utmost importance as we would see the first step here is having a unidirectional path and you see the hexokinases are operative then this is reversible the third step number 3 has again the uh, enzyme which is also bifunctional enzyme we will talk about it phosphofructokinase pfk1 uh, here again we have a unidirectional one and coming to the 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 other part uh, then we have 6 7 8 and 9 and now 10 the the last where we have phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate Uh, the enzyme is pyruvate kinase and we again have a unidirectional one we cannot change it according to our wish and that we would just see why and how so that means the balance sheet of of, uh, of uh, glycolysis would tell us that when one molecule of glucose is going to yield two molecules of pyruvate which is a three carbon compound the balance sheet would be that two adp are formed two nadh are formed and of course uh, we would find that uh, four atp are there but then two two atp were needed in the preparatory phase to convert the glucose into into fructose 16 biphosphate or bisphosphate so that means the story becomes 4 minus 2 is equal to 2 so we have cash in hand in the form of two atp and two nad plus are in the form uh, that is two nadh are in the form of the reduced coenzyme which are in the form of a uh, of a check and this check 
would be encashed in the bank called mitochondria. We will see in terms of shuttle systems how the encashment is done. So the reaction of glycolysis under uh, aerobic conditions will have a net gain, as I said before, of 2 ATP and 2 NADH. Uh, the point is, this is a normal glycolysis that we have studied or we have been studying so far. Have you ever realized that in plants, we do not start with glucose always? Because plants, we have the formation of starch and then the sucrose is formed. And in addition, there is a little difference between the mitochondria of, uh, of plants and animals. Because we would find that even glycolysis in plants will take place both in the cytosol as well as in plastids. And therefore, there is a control of uh, PEP and the other, uh, other substances uh, coming out from uh, photosynthesis also. And we have isoenzymes, which are nucleus coded, which are required for this process. Now, there are two distinct or alternate reactions of glycolysis, which are occurring in the cytosol. And in fact, they are increasing the ATP yield in plants. So we may not always stick to uh, the even the figure of 32. We may even uh, get it a bit more. So these reactions, why are they necessary? Because a plant requires acclimation to environmental stress. What are the environmental stresses? They could even be, uh, say, stress in terms of uh, desiccation, stress in terms of higher temperature, stress in terms of pollutants. So that means uh, another very important difference is that the animal mitochondria would require fatty acids in their metabolism. But plant mitochondria normally do not. And the mitochondria may even respire pyruvate derived from glycolysis. So that means we will find that there is a little disturbance in the sense that a large portion of carbon which is entering the plant glycolysis and Krebs cycle may not in fact get oxidized to carbon dioxide because there are so many other pathways. And this carbon dioxide would, in fact, get utilized in the biosynthesis of various other compounds in a plant, say, for example, amino acids, fatty acids, nucleic acids, and other uh, secondary metabolites. So classic, I just want to impress upon you the point that classical animal respiration would begin with glucose and would consist of these 10 enzymatic reactions, which I have just mentioned and the, the pyruvate would be the ultimate uh, product. Higher plants would start from, uh, would start from starch or, and they will utilize sucrose. So we will have uh, the plastids and the cytosolic glycolysis operative together. And in many cases, you would find that organic acids uh, may be a, a source of carbon. Lipids can be a source of carbon and so can be the proteins. So we have to represent the plant respiration in a slightly different manner. That is, we have, say for example, this is sucrose, it would utilize 13 molecules of water, and uh, ultimately it would give rise to 24 molecules of water. So the net reaction here, we can say, is 12 molecules of uh, oxygen and uh, 12 molecules of CO. Let us look at the uh, pathway of uh, the plant glycolysis because definitely the plant glycolysis provides more metabolic options because it has to now uh, withstand the different types of stress conditions. Here is an outline of uh, plant glycolysis pathways uh, and uh, there are in fact three alternative pathways. Let us look at each one of them in a little details. If you look very closely on your screens, you'll find that we begin with sucrose. So this option is that we have the enzyme invertase and it gives rise to glucose. So that is a normal uh, mindset of our process of EMP pathway, which we have studied for so many decades. Now, hexokinase and ultimately uh, the, the process runs 
or that means the inverters had broken down into fructose also. So we go from fructose. In both the cases, we'll have to spend one ATP. Uh, so that means, and one ATP later. So that means the same equation will be four minus two. But, uh, and if we are talking about sucrose, then we have double. But then there is another alternative pathway, which is, which is run by the enzyme sucrose synthase. Now you can see here that uh, the uridine diphosphate glucose pyrophosphorase will act here and you will have the utilization of inorganic phosphate, which would give rise to the incorporation of the phosphate group at the carbon atom number one. And there is no, there is a complete bypass of, uh, of delta G here. So that means uh, uh, no ATP is, uh, is uh, utilized. So one ATP is, is saved. In fact, why one? Because when we are talking about uh, sucrose and conversion to glucose, so that means two. So that means two ATP are, are saved. Likewise, when we talk about, uh, and then the, the, uh, let's go back and see what happens in the plastic. In the plastids, when starch are formed as a result of, uh, of a photosynthesis, they are subjected to the enzymatic action of starch phosphorylase. And phosphorylation again gives rise to glucose 1-phosphate. So in this step also, uh, the metabolism has saved 1 ATP. So naturally, the net gain of ATP in this type of a plant glycolysis uh, is going to be more as compared to what we just so even starch, when it is, uh, uh, it is broken down by, uh, by the enzyme amylase, it would give rise to glucose. And then, of course, you will have the formation of glucose 6-phosphate. So here, it will be the same. If we go a bit uh, below this uh, diagram, then you have the other aspects. When the pyruvate is formed, then the pyruvate would now uh, undergo, uh, it would either go to the mitochondrion or it would convert into malate or we have what is called as the process of anaerobic conversion. So that means plant ATP is a little different. You'll be surprised that uh, some of the recent ideas suggest that uh, say plants are growing in, uh, in water conditions and they have anoxic conditions. That means there is too much of uh, deficiency of oxygen availability. So they will show various bypass mechanisms. Now, no ATP is needed for sucrose metabolism as we have just seen. Uh, if we are following the sucrose synthase pathway, then these bypasses will result in a net yield of eight ATP as compared to, as I mentioned earlier, four ATP as we would see in a non-plant glycolytic uh, pathway. So we can very safely summarize that plant glycolysis is going to be much, much more efficient energy-wise as compared to the non-plant glycolysis. Another very uh, interesting aspect is how is the whole process of uh, uh, glycolysis regulated? Because there are 10 steps. Each one of them has a different stoichiometry. Uh, some step is requiring ATP. Some step is uh, requiring NAD. It is a redox reaction. So that means there is a precise control. There is a precise allosteric modulation, there's a precise feedback mechanism which is needed for these glycolytic reactions. So the three sites have been identified, namely at steps number one, three, and 10. These are, and you remember, I told you to be very careful about, the, uh, about putting the arrows. You will remember it is these very three sites which were having a unidirectional that means a irreversible reaction, which are the potential sites of control and regulation. So here I've mentioned the three steps which are there. So that means depending upon what is the, the need for uh, ATP by a cell, the glucose oxidation would be available. I made a um, slightly um, illegible sketch, uh, just telling you that this is the first step where the regulation is there, and uh, the, uh, that is by the enzyme uh, hexokinase. This is the first step. If you have uh, more of ATP, uh, then also the, the uh, process stops. The, the second, this is the most important one, which is the step number three, which is the uh, enzyme PFK, 
where if you have an excess of ATP, it is inhibitory to the process. And if you have more of AMP, then it stimulates. So this is the actual valve which regulates the entry of glucose into the, uh, into the uh, glycolytic pathway. And hence we nickname this as pacemaker of glycolysis. And you remember, this is again the step which is unidirectional or irreversible. And then comes the last step or 10, which is pyruvate kinase, where again, excess of ATP is going to, uh, is going to inhibit the process. So that means uh, there is an allosteric of glycolysis at the level of fructose 6-phosphate. Because if you have a fructose 6-phosphate, this enzyme PFK1, high AMP is going to stimulate this uh, enzyme, high ATP is going to inhibit, high citrate content again is going to inhibit the whole process. So that means once the inhibition is at this point, then fructose 1,6-5-phosphate would not be formed and pyruvic acid would stop. So this is a beautiful allosteric control. Once pyruvic acid has been formed, now one should remember that uh, things are not uh, at will, that the entry of the compounds will take place through the membranes. Because one should realize that mitochondria has over 75% of all the enzymes occurring in a particular cell. So it has to be very careful in terms of its permeability characteristics, what to allow and what not to allow at what point. So we find that uh, the uh, pyruvate, when it enters the, the mitochondria, it, uh, there are special channels which are called as porins and pyruvate enters through them. But then once it has to enter through the intermembrane space, that is the outer space into the mitochondrial matrix, this will be a case of uh, proton co-transport. It would be a, uh, it, it would also accompany the the uh, influx of uh, of protons and there are many proton carriers for this so that means uh, once now pyruvic acid is inside it will convert the next step there as you all know would be of oxidative oxidative uh, decarboxylation now this is a very very important reaction because uh, this whole uh, reaction was uh, was devised and discovered by uh, Franz Fritz Lippmann. And uh, if you remember, uh, Fritz Lippmann shared the Nobel Prize with Sir Hans Krebs uh, for the uh, Krebs cycle. And uh, uh, we also know that Krebs cycle will not be complete without uh, the beginning. So, and, and there's another step in, in, uh, in Krebs cycle, which also have this reaction. And uh, this uh, factors, which he discovered are known in his honor as Lipman's factors. So it, it's a very complicated reaction. It has three separate enzymes, as I've mentioned on the screen, and it has five cofactors which are running. I especially mentioned about thiamine pyrophosphate. If we make a, a little mistake in the spellings of thiamine and put it as a, a THY, now this would be a disaster. And uh, disaster would be because this thymine is, is, is a derivative of vitamin B, whereas the THY is a, is a nitrogenous base. It happens to be a pyrimidine. So the whole meaning would change. So this particular uh, reaction I have just summarized. And finally, the pyruvic acid would give rise to lipoic acid NAD. And uh, the acetyl-CoA would now be formed with SH. You know that the sulfur can be put into the compounds in, in various ways. Now, this is uh, the SH, this is the thiol group that we are uh, talking about. And uh, we would like to call this enzyme uh, in the form of a pyruvate dehydrogenase complex because uh, it is not a single enzyme, as I mentioned earlier. It is a combination of three enzymes and various steps in the process two molecules of carbon dioxide have been released because we've started with two molecules. So it is a case of decarboxylation. And in the process, two NAD have now given rise to a reduced coenzyme. So it's a, it's a case of oxidative decarboxylation. Uh, this reaction is also having a delta G of minus 33. So this is the essential reaction and it's called as the gateway step. Because without this Krebs cycle, would not run, so it is the connecting link. 
now we have uh, the the uh, Krebs cycle. Uh, I wish to put, uh, although I may sound very naive, but uh, very few students can write the spellings of Krebs correctly. You will bear me out that uh, many of the times in your answer sheets you have you must have uh, seen Krebs with K R E B apostrophe S. Because the uh, children think that it is uh, Krebs and then Krebs cycle, right? Or merely as Krebs. So it is Krebs cycle. One should remember that. And uh, there you have the, the, the uh, different steps. I may also point out one more thing. Here also one has to be very, very careful as to which of these steps are unidirectional and which of these steps are are. Uh, bidirectional or reversible. Uh, I was reminded of a very old um, uh, copy which I just uh, unearthed yesterday while while preparing these slides. I used to give a photocopy of uh, this particular cycle to my students and then make them remember how the citric acid cycle ran. It was very difficult because uh, I, I belong to the chalk and the blackboard era. And uh, there, it was very difficult to remember. So we used to, we used to, uh, you know, uh, make certain formulae for that. Let me just share it with you. Just look at the screens carefully. Citrate, cis-econitate, isocitrate, oxalosuccinate, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA. Incidentally, alpha-ketoglutaric acid, we call it as glutarate because it is in an ionic form. And, and uh, biologically active form. So uh, from uh, this again has the uh, situation where you have the keto glutaric acid dehydrogenase complex. And again, the Lipman's factors are there. That is why I said that uh, Krebs cycle without Lipman's factors is not complete. So this is how this justifies his uh, sharing of the Nobel Prize. And then from succinyl CoA to succinate, fumarate, malate and oxaloacetate. Now, this is a very complicated affair. How do we remember it? Just look at the point. Uh, we used to uh, remember and make children remember like this. Cricket Club of India often advertises Sachin's services for main operations. Well, you could make anything. But then the basic idea is we have to have certain keywords or certain hashtags to remember these complicated cycles. So what would be the net reaction of uh, one turn of Krebs cycle? It would be that two molecules of carbon dioxide, three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH would be formed. And uh, only one ATP would be realized. So that means uh, if you have to include the Krebs cycle as well as the gateway step, uh, what we would get? The uh, glucose gives rise to two molecules of pyruvate and uh, the pathway through glycolysis and citric acid cycle now would ultimately result in the formation of four ATP molecules, 10 NADH molecules and two FADH molecules. And now comes the calculation for how did we arrive at the figure of 32 where you had some doubts and I also shared the doubts which I had uh, for my teachers when they told me, uh, which was different from what was known earlier. So it has been calculated that reoxidation of each NADH now, and this is done by various sophisticated techniques. The earlier we used to think it, it was three, but now it is 2.5 moles of ATP. So the whole calculation changes and one FADH2 does not give rise to two moles of ATP. It gives rise to 1.5. So that means 10 NADH would give rise to 25 and 2 FADH2 would give rise to 3 and the ATP net gain is 4. So we have a total of 32 ATP. Now, uh, this particular cycle happens to be an amphibolic pathway because uh, if I just go back to the, uh, to the old uh, slide that we have, you can see that within this cycle, oxaloacetate is going to give rise to aspartic acid. So one can branch out from there. Likewise, glutamic acid could give rise to alpha, uh, alpha ketoglutaric acid. That means you could enter there. So in other words, 
this is a pathway which can act as a starting point for other uh, metabolic processes for other metabolites and also it could act as an end product of many so we we say that this relationship makes the citric acid cycle as an amphibolic pathway and then there are the shuttle mechanisms we all know about it but then it will be in uh, right earnest to just summarize one of the shuttles which is the most common is glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle and the yield here is uh, 1.5 per nadh why because uh, we find that uh, the glycerol 3 phosphate once it enters the inner mitochondrial membrane would not allow nadh because it is extra mitochondrial and it has a molecular weight of greater than 10000 so it will not be allowed so it has to convert into its equivalent but then what happens is when glucose 3 phosphate uh, glycerol 3 phosphate enters it is stopped here and the dehydrogenase converts it into dhap and fadh2 and we have just seen that this fadh2 when it goes into the electron transport chain it would give rise to uh, 1.5 so that means uh, the the yield potential or the check that we were talking about which could be encashed to give rise to 2.5 atp would now be in a position to to generate only only um, 1.5 atp uh, incidentally and unfortunately this type of cycle occurs in our brains and the nervous tissue whereas malate aspartate shuttle things are very different uh, we find that the uh, aspartate cannot uh, reach as such the oxaloacetate would now uh, be first converted into malate an equivalent malate can enter and when malate enters then it it, it becomes it has entered the bank and now uh, it can have a free encashment and it, when when it goes to if a reoxidation in the electron transport chain it would yield uh, 2.58 so in other words malate aspartate shuttle is much more efficient energy wise here is a little uh, summary because in glycolysis we have 4 atp and minus 2 atp which were required for phosphorylation in the preparatory phase so we have 2 atp as the net gain if we are going through glycerol phosphate then we have 3 atp which are formed and uh, that is from the glycolysis i'm saying and if we are going through the aspartate malate shuttle we have five so there's a difference of two and in mitochondria now things are the same so that means we have 5 plus 15 20 and 3 plus 2 25 so glycerol phosphate shuttle gives rise to 30 and aspartate malate shuttle gives rise to 32 and please remember that in plant glycolysis we have four more now here is a very old copy of how we used to talk about the electron transport chain uh, showing uh, the redox potential or the electron volts of minus 0.32 and going down to 0.8 of plus electron volts and the metabolic water would come here now this gives us a basic idea we have all been talking about the term electron transport chain transport what does it mean literally transport means across the membrane but here the membrane has not been traversed at all you find that it is a transfer of electrons just follow the uh, the, the the cursor you will find that from nadh then we have the fmn that coenzyme reduced then the iron of cytochrome b then the iron of cytochrome c then cytochrome c2 and then cytochrome a and cytochrome a3 so and then finally the terminal oxidation of electrons and protons to give rise to water so that means the uh, doesn't it give you an idea that it is a case of cyclic no of electron transfer luckily etc and etc both are the same for electron transport and electron transfer and finally the handwritten notes that we had in the yester years which was that oxygen as one has to remember the final acceptor of both electrons and protons which are there 
for the formation of metabolic water. In the modern power lines, we would have the complexes of uh, the electron transport chain. And finally, the complex five uh, would, from the complex four, you would have now the terminal oxidation and they are arranged on the uh, membrane of the mitochondria in uh, a manner which has been shown. So just to summarize, we find that the, the protons have to enter the F1 particles to give rise to ATP. Now, this is also very sketchy and an oversimplified version. If we find the electron transport chain, how does it act, uh, take place uh, on a membrane, then you will have uh, an idea as to various complexes are there. This is the, uh, the inner membrane. This is the matrix of the, uh, of the mitochondria. So this happens to be the, the uh, M phase and uh, sorry, this is the M phase and this is the C phase. So you would find that uh, here you would have various cytochromes and this is the F0, F1 particles and uh, which have the enzyme ATP synthase which ultimately releases uh, energy. Uh, one more aspect I wish to share with you. Uh, we all remember the night of uh, December 2 and 3, 1984, the unfortunate Bhopal gas tragedy, which is considered to be, which is regarded as the, as the worst industrial disaster in history. And what happened is that uh, methyl isocyanate was released from one of the tanks which leaked of the Union Carbide uh, factory. And uh, we find that so many people died instantly. But then we never mentioned that all the plants of Bhopal died. So that means there are various alternative pathways within plants also. And they, they are contributing to what is called as the cyanide resistant respiration. Actually, if we look at the electron transport chain uh, very carefully, there is an alternate cyanide resistant oxidase enzyme which is present. So just look at this diagram, you will find that uh, there, there are, these are the various components of the electron transport chain and this cytochrome A3, which is incidentally, all of them are iron containing, but this cytochrome A3, the cytochrome oxidase enzyme that we have is having a, a, a copper uh, cofactor. And therefore, it is uh, the, this copper which makes it sensitive to cyanide, azide, and carbon monoxide. And so therefore, if somehow one can bypass this particular uh, cytochrome oxidase, and you have the complexes which are bypassed, so that means uh, coming back, we would find it, if you have an alternative cyanide resistance oxidase enzyme, and uh, it... Uh, transfers the electrons directly from the UV canon pool directly to oxygen, then this particular uh, cytochrome A3 is bypassed and then there will be no uh, cyanide toxicity. Why is this aspect so very important? Because uh, there, there won't be any Bhopal tragedies. And as you know, uh, when we study ecology, that uh, cyanides happen to be one of the top 10 of the environmental gaseous pollutants. So I wish we could in future transfer the genes uh, to an animal also for, uh, for <coughs> cyanide resistance. And in that case, uh, uh, one could have a glass of uh, KCN in the morning and uh, enjoy carbon as well as nitrogen, right? In the form of uh, protein, uh, it is just on the lighter side. But then uh, this is how the dreams begin. So this is the basis of uh, cyanide resistant respiration where there is an alternative oxidase. So directly we are now going to an alternative oxidase bypassing the cytochrome A3. And therefore, once the complex is bypassed, then there's no question of cyanide toxicity. But then everything comes with a tag. If you are bypassing these particular complexes, then the ATP production is also stopped. And when the ATP production is less, 
then what would happen to the extra amount of energy which is uh, generated because it could not be harnessed in the form of uh, ATP. So that would now be released as heat. So it is how these particular plants are going to uh, increase their temperature and they are called as thermogenic uh, plants. There are so many examples uh, of plants belonging to the family Eresi, which are thermogenic. Even, uh, even lotus plant is known to uh, release a high temperature. There are various skunk plants and, uh, and they, they may also release various volatiles when they are having, and you know, this may add uh, um, the, or even attract the pollinators for achieving pollination. Now, how the ATP, uh, just to summarize the idea, how is ATP produced? Because we say ADP plus PI is equal to ATP. This is according to the chemi-osmotic model, which was proposed by Peter Michel, who got a Nobel Prize. So the basic idea is that there is a chemical reaction and the osmotic driven by transport. That means this, when it is driven by transport, the high proton gradient, which is generated, is going to force the protons to enter through the proton channels and to have the uh, functioning of the enzyme ATP synthase. And once this happens, as you can see, the protons, when they enter only through these channels, they can easily go out, but they can, uh, this, this membrane is not permeable to the protons except at these proton channels. And this is how the ATP is generated. And uh, finally, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the new model, which was given by uh, the Austrian scientist, uh, Ephraim Racker, uh, which suggests that there is a, a, a rotor and various types of proteins which are present. And this is how uh, Richard and uh, different types of proteins, and they are responsible for the generation of ATP. So just to summarize, we have different types of energy sequences going on where there is the substrate level phosphorylation and the electron transport chain. Uh, I would end up again by, uh, by remembering Dr. Malik through a, uh, through a very memorable photograph which uh, our student Avi took uh, by a self uh, projection photograph. We can see all our colleagues, not all of them, but many of them. And uh, it is really wonderful to have uh, uh, worked with uh, all the wonderful colleagues that I have. And I've just reminded of, uh, of a couplet in, in Urdu. Itne achche logo ka saath, kya ye mehz ittifaq hai? Nahi. Zaroor, uda ki bhi kuch saazish to rahi hogi. Right? And we have uh, at the end my good friend uh, to whom I dedicate today's lecture. And I wish everyone a very long life with a good, healthy respiration. Thank you. Thank you, John, sir, for your engaging and informative talk. Uh, when I uh, joined the college as a young teacher, one of my colleagues had told me if I really wanted to know how a teacher should teach, you should actually go and sit in Johan sir's class and listen. So today now I understood why he had said that. Now, sir, with your permission, uh, may I take a few questions from the audience? Certainly, my pleasure. Uh, the first question comes uh, from our uh, SM Jhasa, who has asked uh, the first question. In case of uh, COVID infection, what changes do we notice in all these respiratory reactions? And the second question he has asked is, what happens when a person dies? Okay. Uh, well, uh, mm, I have not experienced the second part. So I may not give you a first hand account of what would happen, but uh, of what I, I know in the first, because I, I, I'm a bogey of the first part and uh, I am myself a sufferer. What really happened during COVID was 
that all the alveoli of the lungs, they really got blocked and they got uh, uh, absolutely uh, fragile. And uh, as a result, the entire process of oxygenation got stopped. The blood circulation to, uh, to the lungs got stopped. And uh, th 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 this leads to fatality. If uh, uh, it is controlled within time and the lungs get clear, then of course it is there. So this is only an oversimplified uh, answer, Jhaji. And greetings for the day. You have been a very long uh, lasting colleague of mine and we have shared so many thoughts together. Uh, and what, what really, it's, it's not only about the lungs. It is uh, the, when the circulation to lungs stops, then the, then the purification of the blood also stops and then uh, it may lead to a degeneration of various other organs which did not receive the right uh, oxygenated blood supply at the right time. But what would happen when a person dies? Obviously, the, the process of uh, respiration stops. So it's not like in the movies that we put our fingers near the nostrils uh, of, of a person and says, okay, chala gaya. It's not like that. There are many other changes also which are taking place apart from the cessation of, uh, of respiration. Because the respiration, it stops. That means the battery is completely discharged. There's no ATP production. And then if there is no ATP production, how can, uh, how can a biological system live on, on any other form of energy? Uh, that would be, I think, the, the justified answer. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question comes from Mr. Naushad. In glycolysis pathway, if some inhibitors uh, prevent the reactions, what will happen? Uh, that means if glycolysis is prevented, uh, I guess that's what he's asking. Yes, uh, because if you uh, if we were to look at the literature, there are there are uh, uh, terms like pasture effect and crab tree effect. I did not uh, dwell upon them because otherwise the discussion would have become too textbookish. But then there are certain situations because if you are going to stop the glycolysis, that means. Uh, pyruvate supply is limited. If the pyruvate supply is limited, then there could be many options. One, the, uh, nothing would enter the Krebs cycle. And as I said, the Krebs cycle is open from the other parts like uh, malates and uh, alpha ketoglutrates. They, they, they can take some substances and run it for some time, but not indefinitely. So glycolysis uh, cessation would also mean ultimately a cessation of uh, of uh, Krebs cycle. I'm talking only about aerobic respiration, not about anaerobic respiration because in anaerobic respiration, Krebs cycle is not there. So they are very happy because they can, they, uh, if, if uh, here also the glycolysis stops, then uh, they, they, they can, uh, if they are um, uh, facultative, they could go to the other options. But naturally the uh, respiration would stop. Because glycolysis is the is the uh, common pathway between aerobic as well as anaerobic. So pyruvic acid or pyruvate would be needed. Indeed. Um, so Mr. Amarnath has asked the next question. Can you please elaborate more on the Hamburg uh, microbes? Uh, well, I was just reading through uh, the... Uh, mm, copy of, uh, of the giant company Shell, because my son happens to be working in, in Shell. And uh, he just gave me a copy that, uh, don't think that if we are all villains, we are, we are spilling oil all over the place. We are now uh, engaged and we are financing lots and lots of biotechnological researches where we are engaging scientists so as to develop uh, bacteria and the other allied microbes, which are essentially marine, to, uh, to scavenge the hydrocarbons in case of an oil spill. Not in case of an oil spill, even during the regular operations of uh, offshore drilling, there is always a leakage of oil. And it is posing a threat to all the natural ecosystems all over the world, 
uh, especially the the fragile ecosystems of the coral reefs right and uh, therefore uh, they said that it is a part of our strategy to now uh, talk about these uh, hum bacteria or hum genes so that they can very effectively uh, break down the oil yeah, uh, one must be familiar about the work of uh, professor chakravarti because we have so many of the bacteria which are are uh, feeding on oil and they have been genetically engineered of course it has not been used on such a extensive uh, uh, commercial scale so that you will have the the entire oil spill uh, finished within a few days but then they are still in their experimental beginnings and infancy and i think they will they will have a very potential future now we are indeed hopeful of that sir uh, next question uh, has been posed by dr chitralekha where are the six reactant water molecules used so this is what she okay asked. the those six reactant molecules they uh, uh, you are talking about the the six ones uh, for this we will have to go back to the entire story and uh, we find that these particular six reactions they are used in while entering also uh, of the of the glycolysis you want me to go back to uh, the perhaps we could find a clue there see water molecules are being used here and uh, the other places also in uh, okay we i i have to devise an entire equation once again to dr chitralekha and i will then justify because often it's very difficult to put and point out those six ones here i would do that dr chitralekha i promise okay sir uh um, may i take up the next question from miss fatima Uh, as we all know that roots also respire and also there are many microorganisms in the soil that also require oxygen for respiration uh, she wants to know if there is any method to provide enough oxygen required uh, for both roots and microbes for different cycles to function properly well uh... actually uh, then you enter the gambit of uh, say biological nitrogen fixation because we find that there are many bacteria which are associated with roots uh, may not be very happy with with oxygen uh, they would require only oxygen as far as the uh, the uh, activity or some of their vital activities is concerned but then when we talk about the nitrogen fixation then you have the leg hemoglobin and oxygen sensitivity so that means that amount of uh, dissolved oxygen can go uh, from the shoots to the roots in terms of malates and in terms of other uh, intermediates and then they can be provided through redox reactions that's the idea and most of the most of the bacteria which are growing in soil uh, they are not aerobic they are anaerobic most of them thank you sir uh, okay. i think uh, this is the last question and then comes from uh, mr divansh sir uh, as you have seen a lot of scientific discoveries with uh, in your experience please tell us how to accept or react to a new discovery or to some new theory well my answer would be to get excited because even after teaching for 42 years when i read a book and i find something which is very different i always ask myself oh why did i not know it before why did it had to come today and so i always like to share it with people so uh, i think the only answer is to to be over excited over anything new that you get let's not uh, get stuck to our mindset because uh, if you are uh, in science then uh, 
previous work is all right but you you do not uh, you cannot live with your back mirror all the time you have to look through the uh, through the front glass also because things are happening so fast indeed sir uh i think there are no more questions from the audience now uh thank you sir for patiently addressing all the questions uh, from our audience it was indeed a brilliant and interesting talk from you sir and just like cellular respiration your talk has energized us with vigor and refreshed our minds with renewed interest in cellular respiration uh it was an apt topic to discuss today considering plant physiology was uh, malik sir's domain and field of interest also malik sir was passionately invested in connecting with as many alumni of our college as possible and what better choice of speaker than our much beloved uh, chohan sir to give uh, today's lecture uh, it's particularly my duty you know because i have shared so many topics of plant physiology in theory and practicals with dr malik myself over these years yes sir very true yes sir and uh, thank you once again sir for uh, taking time out to remember malik sir with us all in such a befitting manner thank you sir uh, now i request uh, dr anju chibber to kindly play the video tribute so lovingly made by us in memoriam anju ma'am sheri ka sir अंजू मैम your screen is not visible anju ma'am screen is not being shared is it visible now yes yes ma'am yes screen is visible. Thank you, Anju, ma'am, for playing the video. I would now request uh, anyone who wants to share their experiences or share their memories with the uh, uh, late Dr. 
Dharmendra Malik. We can unmute them and they can share their experiences. Anybody would like to say something? Yes, Mom, you can speak. Just a moment, ma'am. We'll un uh, unmute you. Manisha, you can uh, you can speak. You are unmuted. Okay, uh, just I was just writing the message. So, okay, just a minute. Ah, uh, sir, it was really nice uh, to hear you and to see you after such a long time. Because um, I just want to say that we we all miss you. We all miss Malik, sir. We all miss all the retired teachers. You must. Uh, you all must come regularly to the college whenever you come to the bank please do make it a point to visit us uh, in the department we all will come from zoology to meet you and uh, thank you so much for uh, coming here today and um, enlightening us with your talk it was really nice to be here with all of you in the sister department and um, thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you very much so though it was a very sad moment initially but then gradually we, we picked up your um, your talk and it it really sir we really miss sir a lot actually uh, from the life sciences society so you must be knowing that we have a life science society and he was our convener from botany we really miss him and the yes. way he used to you know sir motivate us and you know it was the beginning and he used to motivate me like anything uh, manisha tum sab karo hum tumhare saath hain you know i can never forget these words from sir itni achhi achhi baatein bolte the are manisha tum karo हम ऐसे कर लो वैसे कर लो मतलब बहुत अच्छा था इन, उनके साथ एसोसिएशन एंड इट वाज अ वेरी लॉन्ग एसोसिएशन सर मेरे को चौदह साल तो हो ही गए हैं यहाँ पर सो so, मतलब थर्टीन इयर्स का तो एसोसिएशन था एंड ही वाज द वॉर्मेस्ट पर्सन ऑन द अर्थ आई मेट सर ही वाज रियली टू गुड लाइक अ क्लास अ पार्ट ही वॉज अ क्लास अ पार्ट वो इस लेवल के नहीं थे सर ही वॉज अ डिफरेंट लेवल you know as a teacher as a human being he was different so unke jaane ke baad jo void hai aap log botany mein to i can just understand ki sab kuch hi aap logo ko lag raha hoga ki kya ho gaya but even zoology may be it, it is big, it is a very big void will never be fulfilled i i entirely endorse your feelings manisha yes sir so. mera to association aur bhi bada intimate tha maine to unka interview liya tha jab unka appointment hua और जब मैं मैं रिटायर हुआ हूँ तो उनके साइन से हुआ हूँ तब वो टीचर इंचार्ज थे और हम खुद कितने ट्रिप्स पे हम इकट्ठे गए हैं एंड वी हैव वी हैड ए फैमिली रिलेशन एंड वेवलेंथ वाज सो सो वेरी एप्ट यू नो बहुत ज्यादा एंड ही वाज ए परफेक्ट ह्यूमन बीइंग बहुत ज्यादा 
सर इतनी मदद करते थे बहुत मदद करते थे सर मुझे याद है हमारे जोलॉजी में उनके रिलेटिव हैं डॉक्टर संजीव मलिक सर वो हॉस्पिटलाइज थे और हमारा ये नया सोसाइटी का काम चल रहा था सर आई आई कॉन्ट टेल यू मतलब उन्होंने सोसाइटी में रात में भी आते थे तो भी फोन कर लेते थे मनीषा तुम्हारे को क्या चीज की जरूरत है क्या मैं क्या राय दे सकता हूँ तुम मुझे बता दो और सर जब फॉर्म फिल कर रहे थे एसोसिएट का और ये जो हमारे प्रमोशन हो रहे थे सर मैं बता नहीं सकती उन्होंने कितना ज्यादा हेल्प किया तुम ऐसे कर लो तुम ऐसे कर लो ये पेपर तुम्हारे डल सकते हैं ये हर चीज में गाइड किया सर ये तो मैंने कभी किसी को बताया नहीं I I uh, now I remember I last met uh, Dr. Malik in the staff room. Uh, रोशनी को याद होगा रोशनी और डॉक्टर uh, मलिक और मैं बैठे थे ये कह रहे थे कि मेरी टांग में बड़ा दर्द हो रहा है तो मैंने कहा भाई तुम अपने जूते बदलो तुम स्पोर्ट्स वाले शूज पहनो और मोरिंगा खाओ सो डॉक्टर रोशनी डॉक्टर मलिक एंड माई सेल्फ वी वर डिस्कसिंग दी गुड पॉइंट ऑफ ऑफ ड्रम स्टिक्स एंड एंड मोरिंगा डू यू रिमेंबर रोशनी बिल्कुल सर बिल्कुल Though I uh, I have shared a lot, we used to sit together for hours during my tenure as TIC, and when he was TIC, it it is a irreplaceable and uh, it's a big void for us. Yes, I I. He was a good friend. Moreover, he was a well wisher. We will get friends, getting well wishers. That's a tough thing. We all miss it. Yeah, no word to express, uh, but I was planning that I should not speak. But yes, is the time when we can you know, remember. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that in Deshbandhu College, he is the only person whom I know long before coming to Deshbandhu College. I think Dr. Aparna Ma'am knows it well. Uh, he is not only known to me; uh, he is known to whole family. So, and I never say in front of you all. I always say, "Sir," but I always address him as "Dia." So that is my relation, and that is the void created to me in this Hindu college. And before joining this Hindu college. it was just a chance I, my joining of this mandu college is just my luck as an ad hoc also it was not that i got selected i was i was the second in the queue so when my name was you know you know discussed that yes one person has left and now indrakant is supposed to join he is the first person who informed me and he told me that uh, if you are you i am taking class at jargi college at that time that finish your class and come to this hindu college so that's it i i can't say much thank you so much for organizing this uh, you know conference i mean the seminar and uh, i don't think anyone is best as eklam uh, chauhan sir thank you so much sir for your wonderful talk and thank you thank you Yes. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Me, yes, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, respected teachers. Uh, I would like to thank all of you to organize such wonderful alumni meet, and I again get a chance to meet or see those wonderful teachers. And especially, sir, thank you for delivering such wonderful lecture. I remember that uh, maybe you retired in two thousand seventeen or eighteen. We were the last batch. तो अभी सभी की याद आ गई सर धर्मेंद्र मलिक सर थे और वीना मैम पढ़ाती थी अगेन वी वर द लास्ट बेच जिनको वीना मैम ने पढ़ाया सो so, याद आ गया सारा पूरा टाइम एंड धर्मेंद्र मलिक सर की बात करें तो ही वाज ऑलवेज काम एंड कंपोज कभी भी उनको देखा नहीं कि किसी से गुस्सा हुए बहुत पीसफुली बहुत कंपोज हमेशा हेल्पफुल कोई भी किसी भी तरीके की प्रॉब्लम हो नॉट ओनली अकेडमिक किसी भी तरीके की प्रॉब्लम ही वर That person, you know, जो बैक करते थे हमेशा की हूँ तुम्हारे साथ तुम करो कुछ भी सो ही वॉज सच अ ग्रेट पर्सनैलिटी और मुझे याद है जिस दिन मुझे पता चला था वन ऑफ माई फ्रेंड टोल में तो मैंने कहा क्यों मजाक कर रहे हो भाई तो फिर मैंने देखा पोस्ट इंस्टाग्राम पे तो 
आई वॉज नॉम कुछ समझ ही नहीं आ रहा था मैंने कहा यार ऐसा कैसे हो सकता है इतने अच्छे भले लोग <laughs> कुछ समझ में नहीं आ रहा कि क्या बोलू बट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक ऑल ऑफ यू सर यू मेड आर कॉलेज इज वेरी वंडरफुल थैंक यू सर थैंक यू एवरी वन आई ऑल्सो विश टू शेयर उनका एक फ्रेज जो हमेशा हमारे साथ रहेगा हम लोगों को कभी कुछ डिस्कशन करना होता था तो सर बड़े प्यार से कहते थे कि हाँ हम ना बातें करेंगे आ, उनसे और ऑर्गेनाइज करेंगे चीजें इतना मतलब स्ट्रेंथ सर से हमें मिली है हर हर फील्ड में चाहे वो हमारी पर्सनल लाइफ है प्रोफेशनल लाइफ है सपोर्ट जितना सर ने हम लोगों को किया है मुझे नहीं लगता कि उतना कोई किसी के लिए कभी कर सकता है और उनके जो स्माइलिंग फेस है क्योंकि गुस्सा तो कभी वो जानते ही नहीं थे शायद गुस्सा नहीं देखा हमने उनके चेहरे पे कभी उनकी जो स्माइल होती थी अभी हाल फिलहाल में एक वीडियो मुझे मिली पता नहीं क्या मेरे मन में आया होगा हम लोग छुट्टियों के बाद मिले थे और सब लोग लंच शेयर कर रहे थे और मलिक सर सबसे पहले कहते थे चलो लंच करते हैं और हम लोग फिर फटाफट उनका लंच आता था मैम उनके लिए बड़े प्यार से खाना बना के भेजती थी और हम लोग टूट पड़ते थे लंच पे और वो वीडियो मैं कभी शेयर करूंगी सबके साथ पता नहीं मैंने क्यों वो वीडियो बनाई होगी बट आई डोंट नो मतलब शायद या तो इसीलिए कि हमेशा उनको हंसते हुए शेयरिंग करते हुए सपोर्ट के साथ वो याद रखे हम उनको क्योंकि सर का जो चेहरा मेरे दिमाग में मेरे जहन में आता है ना वो बस स्माइलिंग फेस और एक जो सपोर्ट हमेशा उनका मिला है स्टूडेंट्स के लिए हर बच्चे से पर्सनल इंटरेक्शन इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल फॉर एनी टीचर बहुत सारे स्टूडेंट्स होते हैं लेकिन वो हर बच्चे को पर्सनली जानते थे और कई बार जैसे हमारा व्यू अगर किसी बच्चे के लिए कि नहीं इसके मार्क्स अच्छे नहीं आए तो सर उसको पीछे क्या बैकग्राउंड है उनको पता होता था वो हर बच्चे को पर्सनली जानते थे ये चीज बहुत कम टीचर्स में मिलती है कि वो इतना अटैच्ड बच्चे के साथ हो जाते हैं और सिर्फ ये नहीं कि अभी है कॉलेज में और हम बस इंट्रेक्शन तभी तक ज्यादातर लोगों का रहता है सर उनके हायर एजुकेशन उसके बाद उनके जॉब्स अभी भी कितने लोग आज यहाँ जुड़े हुए हैं जो मैं नाम देख पा रही हूँ कि बहुत समय पहले वो पढ़े थे सर से लेकिन आज भी उनका इंटरेक्शन उनके साथ मतलब रहा होगा और इसीलिए वो यहाँ पर आज हमारे साथ हैं आई थैंक ऑल ऑफ यू टू बी हेयर टू रिमेम्बर हिम फॉन्डली एंड विद लव वेरी ट्रू डॉक्टर मधु आई एग्री विद यू एट एवरी फेज ऑफ लाइफ ही वॉज देर विद बी विद थैंक यू और कोई अपने विचार प्रकट करना चाहता है या एनीबडी हु वांट्स टू स्पीक कैन प्लीज लेट अस नो वी विल अनम्यूट इज देयर एनीवन एल्स जैसे आई वुड सम इट अप जैसे सबने कहा सर वॉज एक्चुअली एन आइडल ह्यूमन बींग एक जो एक आदर्श इंसान होना चाहिए वो सारे गुण सर के अंदर थे जितने भी अवगुण हम इंसान के साथ जोड़ते हैं जैसे काम क्रोध राग द्वेष इन सब से सर परे थे ही वॉज लाइक अ सेज एक एक साधु की तरह एक जैसे इंसान को एक आइडल ह्यूमन बींग को होना चाहिए सर वॉज लाइक दैट ही वॉज जेंटलमैन टू द कोर और uh, क्योंकि uh, उनके साथ एसोसिएशन मेरा रहा एम फिल में uh, जिस लैब से मैंने किया सर ने पीएचडी वहां से की थी तो सर को देशबंधु ज्वाइन करने से पहले से मैं जानती थी और हमेशा सर के साथ एक बहुत ही क्लोज uh, और बहुत ही एक एक अफेक्शनेट रिलेशन रहा एक बड़े भाई की तरह सर ने हमेशा ट्रीट किया एक वॉम और एक जो एक केयरिंग एटीट्यूड होता है उनका वो वो आई ऑलवेज मिस he was so protective he was so caring just like an elder brother and uh, he left us too early unse bahut cheeze seekhni thi unka aashirwad lena tha lekin bhagwan ko pata nahi kya manzoor tha humse itni jaldi sar ko le liya i i absolutely pray for the peace of his divine soul aur jahan bhi sar rahe ishq ke charno mein rahe khush rahe 
और हम सबको अपना आशीर्वाद देते रहे so gone from sight but never from heart at the end i would like to thank dr iklavya chahan distinguished speaker for today's event all the respectable faculty members from different departments of deshbandhu college and faculty members from different colleges of delhi university and other universities who have joined us today as a mark of love and respect to late dr malik and to pay homage to the divine soul i would like to thank labmates of late dr malik research scholars both present and former students of deshbandhu college and family members of late dr malik who have joined us today in praying in paying our tributes to late dr malik sir i would like to extend my special thanks to all those participants who shared their thoughts with us in remembrance of our beloved late dr malik sir at the end let's pray together to the almighty that may the divine soul rest in peace in the heavenly abode i would like to end today's event with the timeless peace mantra sarve bhavantu sukhina sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchit dubhag bhavet om shanti 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 namaste to all of you